Let's actually go into the business problem, um, and it's just some quick context, and then we're going to focus on the real backend, the, the real data solution that we built. Okay, so lately in the media, some sometime towards the second semester of last year, and uh, you may have seen things like uh, there's worries that South Africa could be grey listed, um, and uh, the big reason there is and uh, not having enough um, controls in place for money laundering, uh, well, to prevent money laundering and terrorist financing. Um, and one of the risks, risks in the process is that corresponding relationships between South African banks and international financial institutions could be canceled. Just everybody else. Uh, just remember to stay muted uh, unless you have a question. Thanks, Rob. Okay, so um, those corresponding banking relationships could be cancelled, and then um, basically the local banks won't be able to send money overseas. Um, okay, so just figuring out this presentation again. Okay, so the current goal of the application is to flag suspicious transactions and in the future. Um, uh, we would like to block uh, transactions in real time um, and then just quickly showing how correspondent bank relationships work and yeah by the way we had a terminated fee in presentation that's why we see Sarah Connor and, and Arnold here um, so if Sarah wants to send money to Arnold um, Sarah in the USA and Arnold in South Africa um, Sarah's bank doesn't necessarily have a relationship with Arnold's bank um, but uh, she has with Citibank and then Arnold Bank does have with Standard Bank. So basically it goes through this entire process. Um, and each of these banks have what they call a corresponding relationship. Um, and then just these are some of the penalties that could occur if um, you don't manage your, um, your corresponding relationships well, um, or if you found to yeah, not having the right process in place. So um, quite a big penalty as you can see. Um, we had really nice GIFs showing the actual solution on Power BI. Um, however, it's very sensitive data. It's, um, it's swift transactional data, so it contains names and account numbers and the likes. So yeah, we cannot uh, show it, unfortunately. Um, we, we thought of a way to mask it, but yeah, it was just too risky. Anyway, so the features of the application itself, uh, we look at address media, so we can look at all the transactions by entities tagged with address media, um, and then also review those articles containing the address media. Um, then there is um, risk appetite statement violations. So a risk appetite statement is just a bank saying what type of risk they can, um, what they have appetite for, basically. Um, and then there could be a violation of that risk appetite. Um, so they might say it we're not comfortable with any transactions to Russia um, because there's sanctions in place at the moment and then you should actually be blocking or preventing transactions going to Russia. Um, so you can view those transactions that are flagged um, and then there's also one looking at external data where we try to determine the industry that a entity is involved in. So we use machine learning models there. Um, and then, because there's some banks that would say they're not comfortable if transactions, um, if there's entities involved in the transactions that um, have something to do with charities or cannabis or whatever, and it's not that they have a problem with the industry itself, it's just those industries are typically used for money laundering and terrorist financing. Um, and then there's uh, also geospatial analytics uh, where we look at suspicious geospatial patterns. Okay, so that was the quick introduction, and now we're getting to the technical part of it. So I end over to Stefan um, for the detailed architecture. Cool, yeah, getting into the nuts and bolts of this thing. And it was a cloud first solution. We built everything that we could on AWS, um, and then we were using a few Atlassian tools as well for source control and maybe like DevOps uh, as our sprint boards. So I don't know, can you zoom in a little bit more on those APIs? I just want to talk about the, the data sources. The, the, the central data source we used was an index, a feed, feed of the index, um, index, which was our feed of the Swift messages, and that came in the form of an API that we ingested every hour. We got the transactions that had happened in the last hour. Um, and then we were kind of cross-referencing 
that on the results from a Bing API as well that we were using to get address media on our legal entities. Those guys making the transactions. And then you can kind of see the flow. Um, we, would, we would grab from the API, ingest it with a Lambda function, uh, which would spin up and run once an hour on a schedule. That will get stored into blob storage or um, just S3, uh, S3 buckets. Um, and then that will finally get processed and curated into, into and through a database and a bunch of players, which finally connects to Power BI through a bunch of gateways. Um, and th th this was actually really fun and challenging to do. Standard Bank, where we did the project, was very strict on how we were trafficking that data through all the networks. So figuring out who to talk to and how to actually network it through all of those different gateways was a really fun challenge. So if you ever have trouble with VPN tunnels and stuff, you can ask Brian and myself. Maybe we can still remember everything. <laughs> Yeah, so that's the gist of it. We also have an embedded Power Apps um, for users to then approve or reject certain predictions that we had made, predictions, maybe more classifications, um, most of them which were rules-based, and eventually some of them were also using machine learning models to make those kinds of predictions. And yeah, that, that's really the nuts and bolts of it. Um, we can carry on to our journey. Uh, yeah, our journey is down there on the right. Okay, this is all the tools we used. Yum, 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 skip through that. All the pretty logos. There you go, yeah. So, yeah, back to you, Ryan. Yeah, so, yeah, we got, initially we got some static data, and the idea was that we wanted to um, basically show value as quickly as possible to the client, uh, and not roll this solution for six months, and then, no, it's basically the agile approach. Um, and let me just take a step back here. Um, I think what's really important here is the journey that we followed and all the, you know, how this um, solution evolved. Um, and that's, that's the main focus of the presentation. And then there's some aspects, of course, um, more related to the design that we did. And yeah, please feel free to ask uh, questions at any time. Okay, so uh, we got the static data, and the idea was to um, do a form of rapid prototyping. And, and Power BI is pretty good with that because you can do all your ETL by just clicking buttons everywhere. Um, so that's exactly what we did. Um, and we also anticipated what um, a, a database would look like because we knew at some point this data will have to come from a database um, that's structured into a third normal form that's optimized for storage and all those things. Um, so we basically structured our queries um, to uh, as a, you know, in, in that third normal form already, that everything in Power Query. Um, but, Stephen, can you remember what happened then? <laughs> yes, uh, so if you pan a little bit to the right, we very quickly ended up with a kind of spaghetti-looking structure uh, of transforming the data. Uh, even more, let's get looking, show the spaghetti. Yes, spaghetti yes. map. So Power BI shows you how your Power Query flows look. Maybe this is normal for you guys, <laughs> for some people, but this was definitely way too much for me to remember at one stage. And we tried to avoid circular references when we were making this, but we inevitably kind of ran into them. And then eventually we also had to untangle that. So yeah, it was definitely a learning curve. Using Power BI, I feel like we were really pushing its limits there. Um, and it was also very fun to do. Uh, but what it enabled us to do is get some real looking data, even if it was static at the time, and show that to our end users and start running these little user groups inside um, the client groups and ask them, you know, is this kind of how you would like to see the data? We could start that conversation before we even had a pipeline to work with. And then in the, in the same time, we were, we were also building that pipeline. So it enabled us to quickly get a working pipeline of data with a Power BI report that already looks like it's doing that. So we knew what to expect with the data and we knew what the clients wanted. Yeah. Yeah, and just some of the challenges that we experienced, we saw that spaghetti model is that the report refresh, or actually the data set refresh was really slow, it was one to two hours. Um, and although the service can, the Power BI service can probably handle it, um, it was really difficult to um, extend what we already did because every time you wanted to make a small change in Power Query, you had to go and click apply to all and sit and wait for one to two hours. So, not productive at all. And um, just to give you an idea, this is a lot of data. We have about um, uh, half a million records a month. And so uh, it, we were testing the limits of Power BI from that sense. Obviously, there's, there's ways that you can um, optimize this. We actually tried importing a subset of the data using a, uh, just a parameter. Um, but for some reason, that had a very limited effect. 
Um, however, we didn't want to spend too much time on debugging that because we knew we, we eventually wanted to um, migrate or mature to a database. Yeah. So then the, the next step quite naturally was to actually build that backend data processing pipeline. And that was to get the dynamic data. I'm just reading it here. That's exactly what we ended up doing. Um, and while doing that, we were also focusing on the user first. So before we started building any of the databases, um, we created conceptual, logical, and physical ERDs. And then we took the client through it. We said, this is how we're going to structure the data. Does this make sense? Is it, it doesn't make sense for one remitter to send to one beneficiary. How many banks are usually part of a transaction? We're modeling that out, and we, we actually, we were, we were in, what do we call it? We, we had the whole thing upside down a couple times. And with the client's help and constant feedback sessions, we were able to map this um, real world transaction data into a quite simple and easy to understand database, as simple as we could keep it. And the acceptance criteria for this database was it needed to solve, firstly, needed to solve all of the user stories that we had already written out from all those sessions with the clients. And then secondly, it had to be the normal form. Those are the only two requirements, acceptance criteria, and uh, at the end of the day, we reached those. Yeah. And um, yeah, then actually the next step was to move that ETL logic to the database. So um, to some extent, we could actually look at the um, query steps we generated within Power Query, um, and then apply that same logic in our um, store props that, uh, to transform the data from a typical raw layer into a third normal form layer, um, which we call our curator layer. And um, I'll come back to that. I just want to show some of the design considerations we had and to create this uh, data warehouse. Um, and it was just how would we actually separate the layers and it goes from most complex to least complex here on the right hand side. Um, so we could have separate service and then this is a, a AWS technology we have a read replica. But it's more for um, application databases with um, a lot of reads and writes. Um, I mean we only had about 100 users so we didn't need a, a separate read replica. Um, and it's also quite expensive, difficult to maintain and extend. Then the middle ground is having um, separate databases. Um, biggest challenge here is, so that's for the different layers, a raw layer, a curate, and a data product. Um, but uh, we are we're using Postgres as the database, and um, you actually need to use a foreign data wrapper. It's not as easy as in SQL Server where you can just do cross um, database queries. Um, you need a foreign data wrapper. And it's not difficult, it's just you know, tedious to, to set up and extend and maintain and so on. Um, and then lastly, this is the solution that we went with. Uh, we thought that the uh, uh, problem was simple enough that we could do this. So basically we had a single database and we did a logical separation using schemas. And you know, typically you, you use schemas to, um, it's, it was actually designed for uh, security purposes, but uh, we did a logical separation using the schemas. Um, and then you can see, how's it, yeah. How's it, how's it? Okay. Um, so in the raw layer, it was basically a replication um, of what we had in our raw results. Um, it was typically first normal form. And then it is a large storage of it, so we eventually um, apply that type of archiving mechanism where it um, deletes the last month's data after it has been um, moved into our curated data in third normal form, uh, where differential integrity um, would be enforced as well. And then our data product, product was views only, and that's typically what Power BI called. Um, and yeah, we didn't really use a Power BI scheme on the end, it was only the data. Product um, and then just basically what this did. Um, so in our raw layer, we would have it in this big flat table, um, which is not uh, third normal form at all, not optimized for storage at all. Then we would uh, normalize it, split it into uh, the different tables, um, and this is how it is stored. So this is basically the persisted layer. But then of course um, you would join some of it again as a view, um, not as a the persistent storage, so any other view um, for the way that Power BI um, required it. Um, so that's these are the, this is the views layer that was in our data product layer. 
Um, and we basically follow this pattern with um, most of the, um, the tables. Yeah, so in the end, um, our refresh time reduced from originally one to two hours to two to five minutes. Um, so, because the database was doing the daily lifting. Um, any other thoughts on uh, the database and Postgres? Yeah, yeah. What it also enabled us to do was we, we, we separated out the data processing uh, actually from raw to curated into data product. We separated that out from Power BI, um, and we definitely want to do this from the start because we wanted to remain tool agnostic. Uh, we might have wanted to move to Click or some other visualization tool, perhaps. I don't know why you would do that. Um, and then also it enabled us, one person was able to work on the, the curation of the data, while another person was able to work on the data set in Power BI. And then furthermore, another person could work on the visualization side of it. So we were able to split it out and then work simultaneously on the same section of work that was originally in Power BI. So we were able to split it out and have three people working at the same time. Now that's another one of the pros doing it this way. And version um, control. Power BI's version control is... Very messy. Yeah, you can use SharePoint for version control, but it's only in versions, it's not source control. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So we we use Alembic. Alembic, yeah. Yeah, Alembic for source control. Um, so you basically do database migrations for every change to your database. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that it also helped us just to do code reviews and so on, uh, to basically bring our ETL um, into source control as well. What's next in the flip chart? Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, so we developed report visuals. Uh, Stephen, you were quite heavily involved with this. Yeah, so as I mentioned, we had uh, we split out into different use cases. So while we were doing the, the static data view at Power BI, we could build the reports for use what we called use case zero, which was just the raw Swift data, visualizing that in a way that the users would like. And then while we were working on the pipeline, We'd already done the visuals on that side and the, the investigation into what those visuals would look like. So we were able to move on to use case one, which was Atlas Media, if I remember correctly. And we were, st we were starting doing um, user groups, as I mentioned, uh, with a focus group of users where we would do mock ups in Miro and we would take them through it. And this is the user stories that we were mapping out for you guys. Does this make sense? Is this what you find important? Um, and then we would we would also use mock ups to show what those user stories would look like in, in a visual way. Uh, and then uh, it basically created this nice feedback loop for us to go to the users, build the mockups, and then by the time we take the next use cases mockups, we'd already done the pipeline for the for the previous use case. So we would show them this is what the data actually looks like now. And we spend like 15 minutes on that, and then it's like this is the feedback you have, what you love, what you hate, and then we would take them to the mockups for the new use case. Uh, and we did this three or four times over and over just to get all of the features and use cases into the Power BI reports. Um, yeah, okay, yeah, but she already mentioned the feedback from the client, and then up, as with any solution, there's continuous improvements, and yeah, um, yeah Stefan is no longer on that project, I'm still, um, so I'm busy with those improvements at the moment. Yeah, that is it. Any, any questions? Out of curiosity, does um, Azure, sorry, not Azure, uh, Amazon Web Services or Amazon, do they have any visualization tools? Yeah, they have QuickSight. Um, don't have a lot of experience with it other than actually using it to check the cost of our AWS infrastructure they built in ICE dashboard. And it was much easier to use than the Power BI dashboard uh, <laughs> for Azure. But it could just come down to the developer. Um, so, but, but yeah, it, it, was, it was really easy to use. I don't know how easy it is to build. I found it interesting you've got, like, you're using AWS, but you've got all Microsoft products in AWS. Yeah, so, so the client is, I think, they probably have the biggest Power BI tenant in South Africa. So they really, really big in Power BI. Um, but they do multi-cloud, and in this case, they selected AWS as the, the cloud infrastructure. No one. And it's a significant <laughs> why. There's that definition, I know this is not necessarily the answer, but there's this whole thing about multi-cloud, about reducing dependencies, right? Mm -hmm. But if either one of those clouds go down, you're out. So now you've actually doubled your dependent, you know, you've doubled your risk, not halved it, because, you know, if AWS, like Amazon had a, Amazon was down yesterday. Microsoft. 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 Yeah. Then your solution's down. Yeah. Yeah. But if Amazon goes down last month, 
now you're down twice in two months as opposed to just once, right? So you got to be careful of that multi-cloud justification because I it's agree. often... It's a big <coughs> To go Everybody cloud. does it, and it's like it drives me nuts. It's like it's you're making it worse, not better. But how do they go? Sorry, how do they go down? Do they have, don't they have multiple data centers? Yeah, it was a networking eliminate. thing, right? So my joke is that they because they just released, they just let go of ten thousand people, yeah. <laughs> including <laughs> the guy who was trying to renew yeah. their sales certificate. Yeah, but there's so many data centers <laughs> for that reason. So mm -hmm. no, but it was a config error, right? That's I mean, yeah. I joke about the SSL certificate. But it is almost always an SSL oh. you know. I can suggest something. Last night I saw Enterprise DNA. They suggest external tools. And one of them that will improve your performance is basically, you know, when you write Power BI, you write a lot of measure, and some of them you, don't, you end not using, or column you not, uh, it's there, but you're not using. This tool, basically would tell you which columns and so on, and you can eliminate that and you improve your performance. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want, I can get you the name. I mean, okay. a couple of reasons written one, and I think the one you're talking about is written by a it's that Swedish girl. Um, you also saw it. No, but I mean, there's a couple of them. It was last night, I mean, uh, at midnight, actually, this morning. <laughs> can I ask around, like, scalability? So, as the DB grows, because there isn't Postgres, right? Yeah. But I can see you're using it for like reporting. However, you're also like uh, using it kind of for transactions, right? Obviously. But how is it going to perform as a DB girl? I mean, it's like what, half a million records, you say, like per, per month? How do you think yeah. it's going to perform in a year or two? Yeah, so, so the benefits of being in the cloud is that, that you can, we, we don't have auto scaling on it, but, but you can at any point just scale it up. Um, we actually did that. Um, we had an issue in the database and then we had to scale it up in memory. But turns out it wasn't that easy to scale down. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you actually need to recreate it in uh, fancy tricks. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's really easy to just scale up and then the, the costs mostly increase linearly. So, yeah. yeah. Well, you can scale up your database, but Power BI is the one that struggles at the end of the day. Yeah. Oh, you can't it's scale great. Up I missed that. Oh, no, yeah. yeah, no, yeah. No, you're asking right. about the yeah. really because like so, um, you can try to understand like you know I mean obviously I saw because you're writing back to it I mean the approvals right so far I yeah. said writing back to the DB yeah. so obviously I mean trying to look at like why didn't you use like Redshift it's going to be a lot of reporting yeah and then again obviously I think with the transaction the writing part that's where you came in right so I'm just trying to think like how Postgres would perform as compared to Redshift in terms of you reporting and doing analytics from the team. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, no, so, so looking at it back now, I think we could maybe have considered Redshift instead. Um, although I believe Redshift is quite expensive, whereas, you know, Postgres, it's free. You just pay for the infrastructure on AWS. Um, but uh, if you look at the Power BI scaling issues, so in the Power, the Power BI service can obviously be auto scale that's um, once again on the Jira service somewhere, um, but the Power BI report itself, there was definitely a challenge in how much data we can display in the report. Fortunately, uh, the client is typically only interested in the last month's data. Anything further back than that is, it already happened. Um, so um, we, we put in a parameter to only fault it for the last month. Yeah, I think also if that's the case then for historic data you can always just summarize it so that if you want to create trends from it you can still do that without incurring the cost of bringing all the records. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Have you guys considered importing it or creating a tabular model analysis services? Yeah. Because yeah. that's also a good way to scale. Yeah. Uh, and the official yeah. guidance from Microsoft is that Power BI is or well, analysis services. Yeah. Yes. So yes. But you there is no Power BI premium. premium. Huh? I think you need to be Power BI, Power BI premium. Uh, premium or premium pro? That's fine. Yeah. The, the highest tier. But I mean, do you know how much analysis services cost? It's very expensive. You know, it, it's, yeah. you're not saving a lot. Yeah. <laughs> go, yeah. Go to premium, right? Yeah. That's. But that is the future of Microsoft's Power BI strategy. <clears throat> go to premium. Don't don't be looking at analysis services. But there, there's still some niche features. But now we can tell the announcement. But I, don't, I don't think there's a problem. Correct me if I'm wrong. If you only need the last month or two, 
uh, transaction. You can do it in the back end before it comes to Power BI. Yes. In the AWS, you don't, you don't really need the, to come to Power BI because Power BI is not designed for this heavy load. Then you'll wait and, you know, can do, but you'll have to, you know, optimize that quite heavily. Yeah. No, definitely, yeah. Sorry, I see we are actually out of time. Um, is there perhaps a last question? Do you have any questions in the chat? Uh, I was just looking at. Uh, I can see. Was no, question no. one question on cost, but uh, so that was from different uh, participants are messaging one another. <laughs> I the secrets. I mean, I assume the cost isn't much, right? Lambda functions are cheap as okay, chips, right? Uh, spinning up the database isn't expensive. Yeah, so the most significant costs were um, the uh, RDS instance, it's basically a server, um, and then AWS Glue, which is AWS equivalent of Data Factory. Um, but there's better ways that we could have used Glue. Um, if we had the time to optimize that, that would also be negligible. I mean, how does that, that framework then move to real time? I mean, I'm assuming that's the end goal, right? Is, yeah, so real time. I mean, an hour is a little bit late for. I, I would say you would basically cut out this entire part. You, you would. You well, know, so you what are you visualizing there? I mean, if I'm thinking, just thinking about the end goal, uh, you know, this is real time fraud detection. I ultimately need to approve or decline this transaction in seconds. Mm -hmm. You know, what am I visualizing? Uh, is it just visualizing a list of transactions that need to be processed, or yeah, so these are stats? A real time won't be any visualizations. So that would be you trust the machine learning models predictions and you take that as truth and you, you uh, reject payments based on that. So your reports then are accept, decline rates, yes, yes, trends, things, things like that. Okay. Yeah. It's accept or decline the models, right? Hmm? It's just accepting or declining the models. Oh, so that has to happen now. Yeah, so accepting or declining the, the transactions, it's accepting or declining the models. Yeah, the, the predictions or the classifications. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, then let's just go back to the agenda here. Okay, so, uh, before we go to Sven's presentation, uh, we just quickly want to share the plans for 2023, the new BI user group is a format. Um, so, basically, we did some thinking um, on how we could bring in more content but make it also make it easy to present um, and then get a nice um, frequency to it um, so that you know it's it's monthly but also we didn't want to bring in a massive overhead so basically what we are going to do um, the idea is um, on the odd numbered months um, so january march etc we'll be doing a topic and a workshop and more information on, on the workshop um, shortly um, so there will be one main talk. So this event is a little, little bit different um, to uh, that, yeah, to how it will be in March. Um, and then there will be a hands-on workshop or a discussion, but I'll, I'll talk about that now. And then in the even-numbered months, and that one will actually be doing the BI news as usual. Um, and then also it makes sense to do BI news every second month because then you get a nice chunk of very relevant news that we can report on. Um, and then a BI flash or two. Um, so that's the, in case you don't know what that is, that's a five minute presentation on something very small. It could be showing something new you've learned on Power BI. Um, but basically, the content that we do in, that we cover in BI News or in the BI flash, um, we will decide from that session what we would like to do in the next odd numbered month as a hands on workshop or a discussion. Um, because we'd, we'd like to bring in more discussions, typically like we've had now, but allow a lot more time for that. Um, so uh, we'll choose a, a topic of discussion during the even-numbered months, and then we'll um, either discuss it in detail the next month, and it actually gives you a month to do some further research, maybe you know, if there's a new feature on Power BI um, that you would like to taste yourself and give your feedback on um, in that workshop, um, that, that will be the opportunity for it. Um, so basically this is what the agenda for the year looks like um, and you don't need to remember these dates it's basically the last Thursday of every month um, and you can see there's a topic and workshop and then the news flashes 
Um, the odd numbered months will be hybrid as it currently is, but the new slashes will be um, remote only. Um, if we see there's a uh, benefit to making it in person, we can, but uh, it's going to be news and then flashes. So maybe not a lot of opportunity for discussion, but that's, you know, we can look at that in the future. Um, just two things to note here, 27 April, last Thursday of April is a public holiday, so that might not happen, or we might move the date, and then 13 March, um, we just need to discuss that date still. Um, reason being, the annual JP Morgan race is happening then, and uh, I think half of intellect <laughs> that race is quite a big thing, and I think some other companies as well. But yeah, we'll, we'll discuss some options. Um, it just happens that JP Morgan does their race on the last Thursday of March every year, and so that's why it happens. We probably can't do it the following week because that's like going into Easter, yeah. okay. so you might find that we have to go one week early. Mm. So yeah. Okay. So yeah, any comments or questions before we move on to Sensor? Uh, are you sticking to like an hour format? Oh yeah, yeah. Because an hour is short, right? Yeah, the idea is to to stick to an hour, and then of course, mm. um, if there's if you'd like to have a discussion afterwards, we do it. But. We just found when life happens from 6 p.m. onwards, um, yeah. Oh, just when you, so an hour works great for online because mm -hmm. I don't want to be distracted from my life. But if I have to drive an hour, to attend an hour, mm -hmm. the math becomes hard, right? But if I'm two good sessions, uh, yeah, two yeah, hours, mm -hmm. an hour is okay, right? So you, you end up with that compromise. I'm not saying I know the answer to that. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, that's basically why we've, we've done it remote only for the And maybe board, that's a TikTok yeah. idea, right? Yeah. So two hour for the hybrid, one hour for the remote idea. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, not, that, not that, exciting, that's, but, that's uh, too, much, too much PT, to be perfectly honest. In fact, that's the next thing we need to say is, are there any volunteers? I mean, there's, yeah. now we're going from, call it five or six sessions a year to call it 11, okay? Mm -hmm. That's a lot of uh, organizing on the intellect and sales team. So we need BI flash volunteers, we need present, uh, present, main presentation volunteers, um, and we ask that every single time, <laughs> and um, we get very few volunteers. So, I mean, genuinely, it is important, because um, effectively this organizing team is doing double the amount of organizing. And we're only doing it, obviously, because we think it's a benefit to the, the community. Uh, we did the survey last year, late last year, and everyone said, cool, let's do it, let's do it more often. So here we go. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, but we must also watch a little bit of, about time here too. So, uh, please, if there are any volunteers, and, and we are really, really uh, eager to, to invite other people here, don't think a BI flash is a terribly scary thing. It is literally five, ten minutes, something that you did, you figured out, you read, and you tried it out, and you said, oh, that's actually quite cool, people will enjoy it. It's a very friendly audience. Give it a shot, show it off. People will uh, uh, learn something from that, and it's, and it's contributing to the community. So give it a shot. Yeah. I'm happy to volunteer. Nice. Awesome. I've actually got a cool topic in mind. Okay. I'm going to start with the name of last year. Okay, cool. Let's see about this. Okay, but yeah, without further ado, um, next up is Sen's presentation on the top features of 2022 of Power BI. Um, yeah, so. I can't remember if we did it last year, but it's, yeah. it's almost becoming a tradition for you to do the top feature. <laughs> Guys, I'm not sure what that letter A is there, but it's on it's on my whole on every one of my windows now, just from the last half an hour. So I'm not Black sure. Guy. Yeah, I'm not sure what that's about. But anyway, not uh, caps lock or something. I don't know what it is. <laughs> Strangest thing. Um, but nonetheless, uh, yes, it's actually quite a few times that I've done this presentation. Obviously, each year the content changes. Um, so um, I basically prepared it from last year, uh, all the features. I've scraped the data off the website, put it into a spreadsheet. Uh, in actual fact, maybe I'll, I'll start with that. I mean, when you think about it, Power BI is very, very busy. There's a feature release every month except for January. Okay, and that's normally contained in one video. Uh, if you look at the, the actual blog post, besides that one video per month, you know, there could easily be 10 or 20 or 30 other updates. Now, I didn't look at those 10 or 20, 30 other updates. I only looked at the main feature um, 
uh, updates that come out once a month, you know, the one that contained most of them. Uh, now, there were 277 features. Okay, now that's a little misleading because some of those are connector A got an update, connector B is new, connector 3, you know, C and whatever, so, or new visualization or whatever. So I basically ignored those, but still 277 is a lot. So now you think to yourself, it's a real world analytical conundrum. You've got a lot of data. Okay, so in this case, 277 rows. Okay, but the point is, You've got a lot of data, so what do you do as an analyst? You basically say, okay, I need to whittle it down, I need to categorize. So I basically went about categorizing it into whether it's reporting or whether it's data modeling, or whether it's visualization or whatever, that kind of story, and then whittled it down some more into, well, this feature was actually a, a, an enhancement of something else from last month, so I called it a repeat. You know, so it doesn't really count as an, an another feature and another feature. And then I categorized whether it was a top, top feature or just kind of kind of out there and once I got the, the group of top I then went and said is it is it like really really top a B or C okay and you'll see how I categorized and basically that's what analysts do you take a whole lot of data and you categorize it and you whittle it down until you've got groupings of things okay. and then you compare the groups and you see and you slice and dice which I'll do on the very next page so actually quite a cool uh, little real life simulation if you think about it um, okay so first of all one of the best features, meaning the A top features, the top top, is that you can now take Power BI and put it into PowerPoint. Okay, so I'm doing that on the next page. Let's see. Um, all right. So, ew, it's quite small. Um, all right, so that's a Power, Power BI uh, from the service. It's a Power BI link straight into PowerPoint. Uh, it came out September ish, okay, uh, last year. And. Um, in the olden days, it was the screenshots, okay, except now it's a live connection, which means I can go and say, well, actually, please just show me the A features, okay, now it's live and interactive. Genuinely amazing, amazing stuff, okay. Um, yes? What does this do to the file size of the PowerPoint file? I don't think there's any. It's small. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's tiny. Remember, it's now just yeah. an iframe inside yeah. of a thing, as yeah. opposed to a JPEG. Yeah. But it's small. So, what you can do is you can say, turn it into a screenshot and then it captures it. Or you can say, no, I want it live. But obviously, when you open PowerPoint in a month's time, when you do your next presentation, they've made it that you would have to say, okay, just refresh it. Otherwise, your, your, your moving data kind of could get in the way. So in this case, you particularly choose, yes, I want to refresh it, and then it does its thing. But the best part is obviously you can just interact. So if I were to go and say, so I've got to get this thing out of my way. Um, if I were to say, okay, I've got the A category only, but I want to see what they are for reporting, uh, and are you in your meeting? Okay, have I done it yet? Okay, where's my mouse gone? Oh, uh, that's not crazy. Okay. You uh, see your mouse moving around? It's on the second yes, box. Yes. Oh, yeah. no. Something is, now the A is turned into a three. Anyway, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, okay. Less than ideal, page up. Okay, all right, the point is, uh, I can't actually get my mouse there. Um, if I were to click on, I cannot do it. Okay. Oh, that's a good idea. I'm going to use. Sorry, I'm going to use Nikhil's mouse. Uh, and also, uh, it might just be. Is it on? Okay. Nice. Thank you. Page up. Okay. Oh, beautiful. Okay. So now I can go. I'm on rank A, and I'm reporting, and those are the three. Okay. So it is small. Now, field parameters, we'll talk a little bit about that. Really, really cool feature. Um, mobile for formatting options. Now, now this updated many times during the year. And I've basically just chosen one of those and said, okay, collectively, that's definitely an A feature. Meaning, in the mobile version of Power BI, you can now change fonts, you can change card layouts, you can change buttons and shapes and filters and slices and whatever. So you can literally change everything about the mobile layout so that you know a big card no longer takes up this enormous thing of your mobile layout you can change it all around uh, same with font sizes and your titles and heading all of that can be changed and then of course that won't affect your normal view okay so definitely that is cool although it came out over many months okay um, and then i've just put there i think the azure maps update so in the olden days azure maps which is very powerful could only work if you had longitude and latitude, whereas now during the course of last year, they changed that. So now I can look up things like cities and towns and whatever, and now you can basically use it as, as normal. 
Yeah. You got you got they, they didn't it didn't recognize a city name or a country name. Or a street address, doesn't Yeah. <laughs> so it, it does that now, um, and that's part of the release. Um yeah, anyway, look, I mean it's that was in March last is that eight or three? Okay. Um it's probably an update, right? Because you yeah. always had to do one of two things. Either you had to have yeah. latitude and longitude, and then yeah. what you had to do is you had to go mark those yes. things in latitude and longitude. Or you could take a column. Now, what you had to do, and this is maybe what they've yeah. done, is you, if you had a street number, street name, you know, in separate columns, right, you could never report on it. Yeah. it so it, it all had to be in one column. So you had to create a, a, another column with the appended, but it okay. always did that. Okay. And then it used Bing maps to basically okay. then geocode, right? So it yeah. took a long time to, yeah. to go and do all of that. Yeah. So look, basically, I used to use the old version of maps, well, the normal version of maps, not Azure. But now, because Azure is, the Azure maps uh, visualization is more rich and it works now as the old, the normal one does together, they work well. Okay. Uh, then under the service, uh, I've got my personal favorite, the cross tenant uh, data set sharing. Okay, so basically that just means business to business sharing has got next, gone next level. Okay, so for ages, for years, you've been able to, I can create content, I can share it with someone externally, but now what's happening is, okay, by the way, that's all done through Active Directory guests um, story, but my licensing can provide you access so I can share a report with my customers or suppliers and so on. But on top of that, they can now create uh, analyzing Excel, they can they can connect their Power BI desktop to my model in their tenant, and create add a comp create a composite model by adding other data sources, maybe an Excel thing or something else, to augment my data model in their environment, and then publish that to their colleagues. Um, so you can see it just it, it grows and grows and grows, uh, and that came out um, also. It came out and then wasn't quite ready yet and a month later they kind of made it all work i was beyond myself with excitement really really good um the next one uh, i think has got a um, uh, really really cool thing um uh, downloading a power bi file uh, is now available for more scenarios okay so i love this um for sql saturday many years ago i did i did a presentation on how you can take a normal power bi model and then delete all the queries in it so that you can then point it to a really published model so that you take the file with all the pages in it and instead of it being your main model you now point it to another master model so that you've only maintaining one master model and you might have three or five or other reports pulling from it so there was a, a long roundabout way to do that okay um, now you go into the service and you say uh, download this report and it will download the report with all of its pages and when you choose either download the whole report with the data model that's the, the normal way it does it but the new way now says actually just give me the connection to the main model and give me all the pages uh, beautiful thing okay obviously just to, to, to harp on that the reason for that is you really only want one data model that you're maintaining you maintaining the measures and the connections and the data and whatever and you want everyone else to be using report files that are pointing to that master model so you only have to maintain one thing and it was a bit of a hack if well, speak to the scenario you've gone and created five power bi files and now um you want to turn them all to point to one master file it, it, it was really a hack now it's much much easier so it's a beautiful thing uh, just on that spin i'd like to know does does it still mean though if you add a new page in the main file then you have to re-download the thin files again because you can't add yeah. pages to the already downloaded thin files yeah probably so but in, in this case the, the main reason for that is is you're going to stop using the main model as reporting and do it on the thin file and you're going to now now i've separated the model from the reports when i need to create a new page i'll do it in, in the thin file uh, the, the 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 child of yeah. the yeah Okay, and then the last of the A ones is exactly what I'm doing now. It's the Power BI data, uh, data storytelling, which is Power BI inside PowerPoint, which is effectively what I'm doing now. Sorry, you know, I wanted to make a point on that one. I don't yeah. know if it's new as well, but SharePoint does it. Like yeah. I've only recently spun up a SharePoint site, but yeah. you can also embed a Power BI dashboard there. Yeah. It's automatically, yeah. automatically updating. That's been around for a while. And I mean, I mean, they're also doing things like that now with, with Excel online now, and the data automatically refreshes and you don't have to do it. They, they basically are going, are going nuts about making everything accessible, everything in Microsoft, 
which makes me wonder about Tableau and, and Looker and the rest. They really must struggle. I mean, to embed a, a Tableau report in, in PowerPoint, I don't know, I guess you could probably do it in some way, but <laughs> this is easy, very, very easy. Okay. It's called a sticky data, a sticky business model. Yes, yes. I was going to say, that's how you avoid people using Tableau, yeah. <laughs> using your product. Yeah, big time. Okay, so it's, it's worth just looking at the, the B stories, okay, which now the mouse is doing funny things again. Wow. Okay. I think you need to look up there because it looks fine up there. You, you, you can see your mouse moving and hovering. Okay. There, yeah, now I got it. Okay. Um, so I want B on. This is um, multi select. Okay. Right. So obviously the list is slightly longer in this case, and we're not going to go through it in great detail because we are running out of time. But in terms of the top features in the B category, okay, the data hub, now that's in the service. They're just trying to make it more and more accessible for people to go and uh, start a new report based on someone else's data model and you can do it in the data hub and there, there are many new things there and still some things that are coming up that are going to make that even better so uh, i'm not going to go into great detail about it um, create dynamic slices using field parameters that reminds me i didn't cover that in the a section i mentioned it but we didn't talk about it um, this is linked to it but i didn't want to two features to appear in the A, so I put this one as the secondary one in the B, meaning the, the slices, one slicer can depend on the answers from another slicer linked to field parameters. Now that's important because field parameters means things are very, very dynamic. So you've got a graph on your page and the x-axis is um, your item names, okay? And then there's a slicer somewhere and the end user can say, actually, I'm interested in customers. And then that same graph by clicking on customers, the x-axis changes out of items and into, uh, into customers or into years and months or into something else. Now you can do that on your dimensions, but you can also do that on your measures, which means if you've got your graph and it's January to December and you're plotting sales amounts and you click on your slicer, you can change that to gross profits or costs or whatever it happens to be, headcount. So what that does, is field parameters makes it extremely dynamic for your end user to say the author built it for me with customers in mind but i'm interested in items instead um, so that's field parameters that's in the a list and this is the slicer that go with it um then the next few i think are important but i don't think they're that mainstream so obviously if you are using de uh, deployment pipelines then there were some cool things that came out in in um, october um, so that's number three and four there, deployment pipelines with Azure DevOps extensions and deployment history. So that's quite cool. You can see what pipelines were deployed and when, and you can roll back and stuff like that. Um, dynamic M, uh, M query parameters. If you're using um, direct query, then that's quite a cool thing. Um, but anyway, guest users can now create their own email subscriptions. So you couldn't do that as a guest. Um, hierarchical access by default okay so i've wanted this for a while if you if you've got on a on a graph and you've got year and underneath that month when you drag it in it will go by default to year so you'll have year one and year two next to each other which is not great normally if you have a hierarchy in there you want it to be year and month together you know that year one january february march year two january february march so when you drag it in there, that's the default layout, and it automatically takes the concatenated labels off, which is also the nicer layout, because otherwise it would go January 2020, February 2020, all in the same label, as opposed to now it stacks out the, the months there, and underneath it, nicely labeled, is, is the years. So it's a, it's a nicer starting point, because normally it would start the bad way, and then you'd have to reconfigure it the good way. Now it starts the good way, so that's nice. All right, um, link metrics. Okay, this is the Power BI goals that are now called Power BI metrics. And now, if you've got uh, my department's metric in my workspace, I can link it to the sales workspace, and I only have to maintain one metric, and it shows in both places, which is nice. Okay. Um, uh, okay, so this next one, making it easier to do comparison calculations doesn't really say what it means until you realize that that's the new function, the DAX functions that came out. That's the index, the window, the offset. Now, um, that's the, some new stuff. Jeffrey Wang, basically the author of DAX, he came out and did some blog posts. I don't know, I haven't read anything from him in years. And the next thing, he starts publishing stuff. So they are now looking to create some new DAX functions that makes DAX easier. However, these three, 
if you're comfortable with that, you'll understand it. But if you're not comfortable with that, they're not going to help very much. But they even said the reason for that is it's highly customizable functions, so therefore it's, it can't be that easy. But the others that they're bringing out soon will make some of the DAX stuff that you have to do with heavy DAX will make it easier to do with these new functions that are coming out. So that's quite cool. Um, uh, managing Power BI swims easier. Metric visual. Okay, so you can now take a Power BI metric, which lives in the metrics area in the service, and now you can embed that into Power BI normal pages. And then if you update there, it'll update there. So, yeah, if you're using that, you, you'll enjoy that. Uh, it will roll up. So you can also have subtotal. So my region A and region B goals added together give me my total. Those all make sense. You should have it, but it wasn't there up until recently. Um, all right, I'm just worried about the time. So I'm going to skip a little bit. Um, okay, yeah, relationship editing in the properties pane. So you know the little relationship uh, view with all your tables together. Now on the properties pane, you can see easily this table is linked to this table. It's an active relationship. It's on this column to this column. Quite a nice thing instead of having to go into the manage relationships thing. Um, subscribe to report tool tips. Okay, fine. Um, all right, I just... This is going to take me, uh, maybe just look at it quickly. Okay, quite a long thing. Uh, no, that's too much, too much. Okay. Um, there were two others that I want to mention just as a, as a, um, a worthy mention, I think it was called. And instead of it being in my PowerPoint, I think it's, it's in here. So here's the full list and the special mention I've just put here. Uh, oh, I don't know what I was thinking about that. All of a sudden, you would have noticed your Power BI desktop is no longer yellow, it's teal. If you didn't know that, that the greenish color, it's teal. Okay. It's teal on your SharePoint. No, the SharePoint actually, is they, they said it's, it's, more, it's more accessible for people with uh, color blindness and things like that. The teal is more accessible. Uh, the Power BI logo will still remain yellow and a few other things will still be yellow, but everything else is teal. It does have an Excel-y look. Yeah, it's um, got Excel, SharePoint, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. All right, and then the other one, I just, I mean, I told you I didn't do anything about visualization, uh, um, custom visuals, anything like that, but I do think the Info River uh, custom visual is definitely worth looking at. Um, it, it's obviously a paid for um, uh, custom visual, but for Excel-like functionality inside Power BI with being able to, to format that particular cell, to be able to format these columns and rows and insert subtotals and things in the visual, um, amazing. They also do write back and a few others, other things. Definitely worth looking at the Info River one. So you don't need Power Apps to write back. No, this thing does it for you. Okay, and then the last thing is the not yet. Okay, so they publish this as an update, but it, you don't get it in all regions. Okay, and people like me get very excited and then we can't use it. So we get very sad. Um, so in this case, um, copy visual as an image um, in the embed embedded model. So we use embedded licensing a, a lot. And I would love it that you can right click and copy the visual, but that's not available. Well, it is available, but not in all regions yet and whatever. And in this case, depending on your, your um, embedded capacity type. Okay. Uh, introducing data in space, that one I'm, I'm very keen about. So. If you remember many years ago, or a couple of years ago, that whole thing about HoloLens, virtual reality goggles. HoloLens is Microsoft's VR goggles, they're very expensive. But if you were in this boardroom and someone had said um, they've got a, a power usage uh, report about those lights, if you had the goggles on and you looked at the lights, there would be a little Power BI logo and you knew that you could click on it and see the, the thing. Or, you know, the lights out there and you can see production floor, whatever. But now it only worked with the HoloLens story. Now they're enabling it with your cell phone. So if you, or your tablet, I would imagine, if your camera looks at there, it will show you a little icon that says there's a Power BI report. You click on it, it will open Power BI and show you the electricity usage for this room, those lights. It's quite cool. Anyway, but uh, that's coming, uh, you know, soon. Um, a new way to upload Power BI and Excel files, uh, that kind of story. I'm just out of time on that. Uh, quick measures. Okay, so they are definitely working on quick measures. They're trying to make it natural language. So you'll remember quick measures are, if you wanted to do year to date or a rolling total, they would do it for you. And now they're trying to get it that you can say, rolling average, three month moving average, using sales amount, go. Um, and then they're going to give you the decks. But if it's out, 
but they're just saying, big disclaimer. Yeah. <laughs> Proceed with caution. Rian and I actually did it with ChatGPT yeah. like two or three days ago. We were like, write me a DAX formula for helping the average sales year on yeah. year or something like that. And it actually calculated us for it for us. Mm -hmm. And it wrote down the assumptions it made and calculated it and it worked. Uh, that's so, pretty cool, eh? I know Microsoft has big uh, stakes in ChatGPT. Yeah, so pretty yeah. Cool. I'm going to integrate that with Azure as well. I kind so of it's going to be the AI yeah. that's, that's running on Azure. Yeah. OK, so guys. Um, the only other thing, oh yeah, there's some advances in get data, uh, but when they come out, we'll obviously talk about it. Um, so I've covered the A, B, and C topics and the little special mention. Uh, these are all the ones that come out in those monthly summarized versions. I must say, I'm very pleased that the guy in the cube guys are doing the voiceovers now. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed Patrick and Adam are doing it instead of that other lady. Um, anyway, uh, but that's just a little side comment. And then the other thing I wanted to say is, um, there are still other updates you know in that blog so you literally need to make a conscious effort to go there every second week or every month and just go through page one and two of the things that are updating so what's not on here is um a really cool thing that power automate can now run dax queries okay and i'm going to do a presentation at the power platform bootcamp so that's also my introduction to say that there is going to be a global power platform bootcamp was supposed to be uh, on the 24th, 25th of February, but it looks most likely that it's going to be postponed by a month. I just got that information just before the session now. So towards the end of March, if you're interested in anything to do with Power Platform, there's going to be one in Sydney, and there's going to be one in London, and there's going to be one in Java. Okay, we're going to have one here. Um, if you are interested in attending, obviously, um, I'm sure they'll uh, circulate information, but if you're interested in presenting, let me know, and I'll let them know that you, you can, they are looking for presenters. Um, so in this case, my one is really cool. It's using this DAX query that's going to go on a, uh, on a schedule. Every, every night it's doing a snapshot of my data table into a CSV file, into a SharePoint folder that can get in, imported so that I've got a historical trend based on snapshot data each day for the last one, two, three, four years or months or days or weeks. Um, and that's all possible because now Power Automate can run a DAX query, you know, you know, the whole summarize columns, add columns, you know, it's that actually, one. it's, it's a REST API, right? Yeah. So you can actually go run against that if you want. Yeah. It's, it's a lovely, lovely thing. Okay. So that's everything. I've covered it very, very fast. Um, the only other thing I want to say now was to do with the prize, I think. Um, okay. So we're basically, I think just sort of closing down, ending this story, you know, that every month we do a prize. Um, in the past, we've done prizes for fastest finger first, first person with the right answer. We've also done random draws or whatever. Uh, in this case, I think um, what I'd like to suggest is quite a few of you have already won the prize. Okay? Plus, also sometimes, I know it sounds weird, but you might not want the prize. Okay? Now, that means, well, what is the prize? For those who are new, um, it's a $500 uh, voucher with Enterprise DNA for video courses. Uh, very, very cool courses. Uh, they do ask that you are active in their program. So if you win the prize, you need to watch the videos and participate in their forums and whatever. So basically, if you don't have much time now, I'm going to say to anyone, if you, if you want to be in the prize giving, just drop it, uh, put your name in the chat and anyone here, just tell me your names and I'm going to put it in my Excel spreadsheet, random number generator and one person will be chosen. So either you must be willing to do um, the, you know, be involved. Secondly, you obviously haven't won it before. Thirdly, you might know it all already. I'm not sure. But the point is, if you're keen, uh, yeah, Nikhil, if you can just give me some names. Anyone here who wants to go on the list? Um, anyone, anyone? I won that prize and I was guilty of not participating because it took up a lot of time. Really? Okay. All right. No, I'm, I'm sure that's absolutely fine. Can you tell us how much time, what exactly is it? Uh, to be honest, I don't quite know. I mean, basically what it comes down to is, is, is a syllabus. I mean, I haven't done it, so I don't know. But um, um, it's a syllabus of content, and they basically want you to go through it. And then you've signed up on the platform. So if someone says, you know, I don't understand how this thing works, you know, it's, they're trying to create a mini community. So you would, you would basically answer questions or ask questions, or they've got a uh, monthly, weekly newsletter, and you'd read those things. They basically, it's a very clever plan of basically making their website and their training program worldwidely adopted. They've got okay. excellent training program. Yeah. They've got industrial almost in, in any industry. Yeah. They sample application yeah. and 
Yeah, that, 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 that deal really with the complex yeah. issues. Okay. No, so you can okay. learn a lot. Anyone but you need time. Yeah. Anyone here? Yeah. Only one. Okay. Yeah, yeah well done. Go on, go on, go on. <laughs> Sorry. Go on. Is that you? Yes. Okay, so one second. Uh, so I've got Johan here, and then... <laughs> I just copied it from the chat. Okay. One second. So, okay, it looks like there's a 50-50 chance. Is there yeah. anyone else? Yes. Is it only Power BI? I don't see if Power BI was data analyst or whatever, but is it no. specifically using Power BI? Uh, no, it's only Power BI, uh, to my knowledge. Uh, yeah. I, I haven't done it, so I don't... But uh, Enterprise DNA? Yes. They've got... Uh, Power BI, all the power platform. Okay. And now they're going, they've got the Python and R that link to yes. Power BI. Or you go, so they've got a lot and they're adding, I mean, all the time. Okay. All right. So is it Johan over there and then online Mankoba? I'm sorry about the pronunciation. Uh, Melissa as well. And Melissa. Yeah. Okay. So we've gone from a 50 50 to a one in three. Oh, okay. okay, I'll just talk good. All right, so as soon as I take the little <laughs> asterisk, is that it? Are we done? No one else? Okay. As soon as I take this thing away and hit enter, it is going to give us a number. If it is one, two, or three, let's... So, so it, it's Mangoba with an N after an A, it's fine. All right, don't worry too much. I'm just going to wait until the number comes up. Go. Number three, Melissa. Oh, okay. Sorry, Mangoba, you lost out there. But, uh, okay, so Melissa... Um, I'm just going to put in the chat my email just, address. Okay. If someone else really wants it, I I am happy to. <laughs> no, I'm I'm serious. Like I I, I just I, I if someone really wants it, I am I just kind of into the fun. So anyone else if you want it more, you're welcome to have it. Okay. Mangoba, you wanna you wanna speak up? Or, or, or come next month and then you can get in also. <laughs> oh, oh, that's, a good one. that's a good one. Okay. All right. Or I mean last time actually genuinely in November they did give us two prizes. So okay. All right, cool. I've got my email address in there. You're welcome to send me a chat and I'll link you up with the, the enterprise people. Uh, and I think that is what I intended to cover. So yeah. Yeah. This is a whole new feature I wanted to mention. I actually used it. Um, it's, you, for previously, you weren't able to develop measures in the what is it, the data view. Oh, yeah, view, yeah, the yeah, view. Yeah, right. That's a new thing right now. Yeah. It's a little gimmicky. I have to like, stop editing the main view. You can't like flip between the views while you're editing. You have to stop editing, go to a different view, and then and start resume again. editing. Yeah. Oh, you, you resume where you have all. Yeah, actually, okay. it's but it, like, it still runs the measure, which is kind of silly, so it's not that. that <laughs> but it is a pretty cool thing. Now you can see all your table as well. That, that, I'm a visual person, so it works for me. Okay. Um, yeah, that is, I, I think I put it in top C. You know, because I mean, it's useful, uh, but yeah. when you, when you're like, oh yeah, I can use it. But since it's come out, I, I haven't used it. It should have been there from yeah. the start, actually. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, that brings us to the end of the BIOs of the